gospel. And we find ourselves this morning in the second part of the crucifixion account. Really the epicenter of our faith. Without the crucifixion, there is no faith. Paul called this the message of first importance that Christ was crucified for our sins. And so we are in the second part. Last Sunday, we began to see what took place as Jesus, who's displaying here that he is both the great high priest and the perfect spotless lamb, as he actively gives himself and places himself on the cross. The nails have been driven through his hands and feet. We began to see all that. And yet, the physical agony we saw is not the primary point of Mark or of any other gospel. We saw that Jesus' crucifixion is unique, not for what took place physically that the human eye can see, but what took place spiritually that the human eye cannot see. That is, the atoning sacrifice for sin in our place as our substitute. This morning, I want us to continue to look through this and see what Mark has for us and to pick up on some things, both that which we made mention of last Sunday and some further aspects to all of this. So let's read our passage together. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Mark chapter 15. We're going to begin reading in verse 33 and through to verse 41. This is the second account. This is the very middle, verse 33, of the crucifixion. When the sixth hour had come, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come before you realizing that this is a holy, holy time that you've set apart for your people to gather together corporately. Father, we do so with worshipful hearts having sung, having given, having prayed, and now we come asking, would you please speak through your word? Father, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe that he is a truth teacher. And so, Father, we ask that he would move mightily among us this morning. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. A man by the name of Anselm of Canterbury, he was an Italian man who lived in the 11th century, so the years 10,000 and such and such. Most theologians at that time were monks. He was an Italian monk. He was a theologian who contributed much to Christianity. And one of his more famous works is called, Why Did God Become a Man? In that work, and really what Anselm is best known for, is his understanding of the atonement. I opened the sermon last week by mentioning the need for continual words to be added to describe theologically the work of Jesus on the cross because of continual attacks upon Jesus' work upon the cross. And so what we have today is the term penal substitutionary atonement. Penal because Jesus stood in our law place taking the penalty of our sin substitutionary because he was in our place, and atonement because he bore the sins of his people. Well, Anselm, back in the 11th century, was dealing with erroneous views back then of the atonement. One of those views was that Satan was holding man hostage, and Christ paid 
the ransom. That is today called the ransom theory. It's still very much espoused today. It's an erroneous view of the atonement. The other view is called the classic theory of atonement. Well, no, sorry, rather the classic theory of atonement is known as today as the ransom view of atonement. And that view argues that in order for mankind to be set free and then rescued from sin, because Satan was holding mankind captive, God had to deliver Jesus over to Satan in exchange for the souls of mankind. That is a common view held today among Christendom. That view gives far too much credit to Satan and power to Satan than he actually has. Anselm wrote a book against such a view of the atonement. In his book, the atonement was, that Anselm went on to advocate, was that Jesus' death upon the cross satisfied the Father. That's really the view that Anselm propagated in his book, that Jesus' death upon the cross satisfied the Father. And here is where it can be, it's believed and it can be surveyed, that Anselm himself went awry. Because he focused more on the crucifixion, making satisfaction for God the Father's honor being damaged than on the pacifying of his holy wrath against sin. Now, as biblical doctrines portion here on what is called the satisfaction theory, which is what Anselm propagated, it says this, quote, It is certainly true that God's glory is belittled when his creatures commit sin. Indeed, sin is synonymous with failing to honor God and falling short of his glory. However, Christ on the cross, that is Christ crucified, accomplished vindication of a righteousness in a particular way. Namely, by becoming a substitute for sinners, vicariously enduring in his body the punishment that was justly due his people. End quote. And so over the years, with continual attack upon the atonement, pastor theologians have strive to defend what took place. And we know why. We know why they do that and we do that. Because there are continual attacks upon the atonement. Because what took place on the cross here this day in our passage in Mark was eternally immense. Much of it simply beyond human description. Yet we know... That it was where the sins of guilty man were placed upon the sinless Savior. And he bore the penalty of them in our place, making full atonement, appeasing the holy justice of God, so that we would be forgiven and free, cleansed from sin and clothed in his righteousness. And so... Mark has shown us, as we saw last week, it's not so much the physical agony that God wants us to dwell on. I made mention last week that too many Bible studies and too many preachers dwell upon the physical agony when that's not the point. As horrific as the physical agony was. But instead, we need to focus on the enormity of what took place behind the physical scene, if you will. And that is... That this was not a regular man who hung upon the cross. This was the God man who hung upon the cross. Truly God and truly man, always both at all times. Jesus wasn't sometimes man and sometimes God. He was truly God and truly man, always both at all times. You see, I make mention of that to avoid any confusion because Mark labors very specifically to present Jesus all through his gospel as what? As the Son of God in all his majesty. And as the suffering servant of Yahweh. Spoken of in Isaiah chapter 40 through to chapter 53. And part of that, 
has shown Jesus enduring temptation back in the wilderness in his humanity. Because you remember, if he used his divinity to escape the wilderness temptations, then we would not have a substitute just like us. But because he endured it in his humanity, we have a substitute just like us. And also we've seen that in the enduring of his betrayal and his unjust treatment and his mockery at the trials and his scorn, he did that in his humanity. Serving as an example for us to follow. When he reviled, he did not revile in return. And we've seen all of that. That in his humanity, he kept entrusting himself to a God who judges justly. And yet he never once lives through all of that as not being God and truly man at the same time. This is vital to understand because on the cross, he was exactly that. Here in this day, he was exactly that. He was truly God all while being truly man in that hypostatic union. And having been so, Jesus, the God-man on the cross, accomplishes much on our behalf. And the ramifications of him being the God-man on the cross are profound. When Jesus said back in the Garden of Gethsemane, just yesterday, right, in our account, when he said, let this cup pass from me, do you think he was referring to the physical agony? No, he was referring to the holy wrath of God to be poured out upon him. A human, a mere human, could not experience God's wrath for myriads and myriads of sinners and not be completely destroyed in the process. So as the God-man, Jesus' deity, His divinity, makes Him able to experience the full wrath of God and not be destroyed. And actually rise victorious on the other side of the crucifixion. Which we know He did. Another ramification of Jesus being truly God and truly man upon the cross is that because He is infinite... As God, then the sacrifice that he makes is infinite in its worth. It's of infinite worth. Meaning, because Jesus is eternal as God, he can atone for that which is of eternal worth. Not only that, you remember we're cleansed by the shed blood of Jesus, forgiven of our sins, but we are also clothed with his righteousness that he earned for us, merited for us in his life, his active obedience. We're clothed with that righteousness. And because of his being as the God man, that righteousness that we are clothed with is also of infinite eternal worth. Hallelujah. We needed to say all that here at the office. Now let's look at what really are the last three hours. We saw last week the first three hours. Here now Mark in these verses takes us to the the complete crescendo. And included in this climactic portion that we've just read are startling things. Things like darkness falling upon the earth. Things like a cry from Jesus about God forsaking him. Things like a loud cry from Jesus as well, just before he breathes his last. Things like the temple veil being torn in two from the top to the bottom. Things like the cry of a Roman soldier, a centurion confessing truth about Jesus. And things like the gathering of of a group of women who are loved by God, special to Jesus, servants of the faith. Watching on from a distance as we read. And so there's a lot here. And to help us walk through it, I've broken the passage into three. I want you to see first in verses 33 to 38, a completion of suffering. A completion of suffering. Look there in verse 33. It says, when the sixth hour came. 
as I said, here are the last three hours. Verse 25, back there, we looked at the last night, it says, it was the third hour when they crucified him. And now, here is the sixth hour. God wants us to know the length of time. Each of the other synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, including Mark here, obviously, include clear time stamps as it relates to Jesus' death on the cross. The sixth hour, remember Mark, we saw last time, is counting from Jewish time, so from sunrise to the sixth hour, that is now midday. The sun is in the middle of the sky. Jesus has been hanging there for three hours. Mark doesn't tell us, but along with being mocked by the robbers either side of him and by the Sanhedrin and by the Roman soldiers, which really is, as we saw, a true band of evildoers, as Psalm 22 predicted, Jesus was talking to people. Mark doesn't show us this, but Jesus was talking to people in the first three hours while he was on the cross. It was during the first three hours that Jesus uttered those famous words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it was upon hearing those words that Luke 23, 42 tells us that one of the robbers then says to Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus then grants him eternal life then and there. Included in these three, first three hours, Jesus looked down at his mother and said to Mary, Behold your son, speaking of John. And then Jesus instructed John to then look after Mary. John took Mary into his own home from then on and cared for her the rest of her days. And so from upon the cross, Jesus here in the first three hours was talking. And then right at the sixth hour, 12 noon, Verse 33, God turns the lights off. Darkness fell over the whole land. Debate occurs here as to the extent of the darkness because the word means both land and earth. Whatever the case, it was dark. It was dark all over Israel and the wider Roman Empire as historians account of. This wasn't a solar eclipse that took place, as some want to say. How do we know that? Well, James Edwards, in his commentary, remarks, quote, The darkness at the crucifixion cannot be accounted for by natural phenomena because solar eclipses do not occur when the moon is full at Passover. Passover always occurred at a full moon. The solar eclipses, I googled it this week, they always occur with new moons. This is not a natural event. This is a supernatural event. Darkness. Silence. The noise of the mocking. The noise of Jesus speaking in the first three hours. Here at this sixth hour. Silence and darkness. And when you survey scripture. Both old in New Testament, darkness and God's judgment are explicitly linked. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 30, speaking of the wicked and their judgment to come, says this, And it will growl over in that day like the roaring of the sea. If one looks to the land, behold, there is darkness and distress. Even the light is darkened. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9 through 11, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. The day of judgment is coming cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation and he will exterminate sinners from it that's judgment the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light the sun will be darkened when it rises and the moon will not shed its light thus i will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity speaking of a judgment to come Joel chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 says this, Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the judgment day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom. Amos in chapter 8 verse 9 says this, It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. And so we see time and time again that God's judgment upon 
people is always equated with darkness. God's judgment, no light. Just darkness. What does that mean for us here in our passage? Well, it means here that what you have here is a supernatural darkness that falls upon the earth. It is not, as some want to say, it's not the removal of God from the predicament here at the cross. People get confused when they hear forsaking me. They think that God removed him, His presence from the cross as though He was distant from the event. No, no, what, he, what you have here instead is the indicator that God and His holy wrath are now very much present in this event. As He comes now and pours out the entire cup of His wrath. The cup. Remember, this was the cup that moved the Son, Jesus, to cry out in the garden in His human frailty, let this cup pass from me. And yet who, in His humanity, out of His love, embraced the will of His Father, moved forward, and is now, in this dark hour, drinking down... Every last drop of the justice of God in order to satisfy the wrath of God. Eternal judgment of the Father poured out upon His own Son. Here now, really, here is the sinless sin bearer in His hours of darkness. The first three hours, as I said, were filled with noise as Jesus hung upon the cross, as abuse was hurled His way, and now darkness falls. And you know what? There is no recording in any other gospel, in any of the gospels, of a single voice in these three hours. Not a single event between the sixth hour, and look now in verse 34, at the ninth hour. Not a single event or a single voice is mentioned. So for three hours, an utter silence from the physical viewpoint, in this darkness, in the spiritual viewpoint, unseen was the full weight of sin and eternal punishment poured out upon Jesus and he bore it all for countless and countless sinners who believe that is the number of the elect the sheep for whom the good shepherd said he died for now look at what Jesus cried out at the end of verse 34 Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani translated my God my God why have you forsaken me Here, here is the culmination of what caused Jesus so much turmoil in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember that? Do you remember what it was that caused Jesus, was causing Him so much grief? It was because obedience to the Father, which is what it, Jesus always did, He always did what was pleasing to the Father. That always meant for the Son perfect fellowship and communion with the Father. I delight, Jesus said, to do my Father's will. My satisfaction is to do the will of my Father, He said. He was always in sweet communion. He was always in sweet fellowship with the Father. But what tormented Christ so much was that for the very first time, obedience to the Father's will no longer meant maintaining fellowship and communion with the Father. Obedience now meant for the very first time a severing of fellowship and a severing of communion with the Father. And because Jesus always did everything to please the Father, as He fulfills the will 
of the Father. For do not ever remember, Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, It pleased the Lord to crush His Son. Here Jesus is now severed from the comforting joy of fellowship and the comforting joy of communion with God. As holy God turns His face away in, and please mark this down, in a judicial sense, not in a relational sense. Why do I say that? The Trinity didn't break here. The triune Godhead did not fall apart here. Jesus remained the second member of the triune Godhead, just as He had been from eternity past. But in a judicial sense, in a penal sense, as our penal substitute, as the sacrificial lamb, He experienced for the first time. A break in perfect fellowship and perfect communion with the Father. As the people heard this cry, and I want you to know it was with a loud voice. As the people heard this cry, it was number one, a loud cry, meaning that the Jews heard it. The Romans wouldn't have understood Hebrew or Aramaic, but the Jews heard it. And what they heard, number two, was familiar to them because Psalm 22 verse 1 says these exact words. We saw last Sunday how so many events in the cross are a fulfillment of what is prophesied in Psalm 22. Well, here's another one. Psalm 22 verse 1 says the exact same words. Eloi, Eloi, laba sabachthani. Therefore, when Jesus utters these words, prophecy is then fulfilled in front of these people. And then they began to say in verse 35, look there, when the bystanders heard it, they began to say, behold, he's calling for Elijah. Up until this week, I, I didn't really understand the intent and motivation behind those words, but I can tell you this is more mockery. This is nothing but more mockery. There's not a change now in the scorn and deriding of King Jesus. This is complete mockery. Because Elijah was spoken of, you remember, as one who would be what? The forerunner to the Messiah. And he was because John the Baptist came, did he not? In the spirit and power of Elijah. So these bystanders here, they're mocking Jesus by saying, pretty much, this poor lunatic is asking for Elijah to come because they hear, Aloy, Aloy, Elijah. They, they, they think this poor lunatic is asking for Elijah to come as a forerunner to save him so now he can now be the Messiah. Just ongoing mockery. Jesus, then we're told in John 19, verse 28, we don't see it here in Mark, but it tells us in John that he cries out saying, I thirst. That's another fulfillment of prophecy upon the cross. Psalm 69, verse 21 says, they gave me gall for food and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink, sour wine. Now this wine here in verse 36 is different, we know, from the wine that he was offered earlier. The wine that he was offered earlier was used, as we saw, to numb the pain like a narcotic. Jesus refused that. And here now in verse 36, he takes it. It was used by workers to invigorate them and energize them. Now there may be, as some want to say, there may be utter malice in giving him this type of drink. Let's cause him to suffer longer. Let's cause him to continue to call out for Elijah, this lunatic. Remember, that was the basis. Being a lunatic was the basis, as we saw, a practice for lunatics to mock them as king. You remember that?
It wouldn't be surprising if that's what they did to prolong his suffering. We don't know for sure though, but what we do know is that it gave Jesus, who'd been hanging on the cross for six hours, it gave Jesus, moments away from dying, a quenched thirst and a burst of energy to proclaim. Look at the first half of verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry. What was that? Loud cry. That loud cry was what John alone records and how triumphant a cry it is, how victorious a cry it is and how so very loud it was. The cry, you know it, it is finished. And then after that, Luke tells us he quietly said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Look at the end of verse 37. And Jesus breathed his last. He breathed his last. The final, perfect Passover lamb, our Savior, slain. Prophesied on in Zechariah, Daniel 9, that the Messiah would be cut off. That Yahweh would strike the shepherd, the anointed one. Here he is. Slain. Look at verse 38. Access granted here in verse 38. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What was taking place right as Jesus was being crucified the sacrifice of the Passover lambs and so as all these priests are sacrificing the lambs the veil now there was a number of veils inside that temple but the veil the veil that separated the sanctuary from the holy of holies as they are running in and sacrificing and running in it just tore top to bottom Access granted. Barrier removed. Through the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, fully granted. The old sacrificial system immediately rendered obsolete. The eternal plan of redemption planned in eternity past, now accomplished. New covenant ushered in. The application of this eternal decree of redemption will now begin to fall. That's what I want to show you next. Number two, in verse 39, a conversion of a soldier. So we just saw a completion of suffering. Now we see a conversion of a soldier. Look there in verse 39. When the centurion who was, look, look at that. I want you to just mark that down. What does it say? Who was standing right in front of him. This entire event rocked the centurion to the core. What he witnessed here changed him. This man as a centurion oversaw the entire execution. This is not a centurion. This is definite article, the centurion. The centurion. He was in all likelihood part of all the trials too. He was a commander of thousand soldiers. And there he stood right in front of him at the foot of the cross, having observed all that transpired, both upon the cross there and in the lead up to it. He would have observed Jesus being declared innocent by Pilate. He would have been hearing Jesus talk about the kingdom to come. He would have seen Jesus suffer unjustly and then dying the way he did, saying the things he said, he would have heard better than anyone else because he was standing right in front of him. He would have heard, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He would have seen all of this 
And this affected him so much so that he utters words of confession of divinity, of deity. And he utters the entire theme of the Gospel of Mark. How did the Gospel of Mark begin? This is the beginning of the Gospel of who? The Son of God. Here it is now. What does he say? He says, truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the first time in the entire gospel of Mark that a person and not a devil makes such a confession. Listen to what Pastor John MacArthur says as he sums up this so very well in his commentary. Quote, from the crucified thief to this pagan centurion, trophies of divine grace were on display in the midst of Jesus' death, death upon the cross. One was a scoundrel, that criminal. The other was a soldier. And both were blasphemers who mocked and persecuted the Son of God. Yet in His infinite mercy, God reached down and rescued them, eternally granting them salvation through the very one whose crucifixion they just witnessed. End quote. God's grace through the cross. Right there. The third and final piece in this event here is what we'll call number three a collection of servants in verses 40 to 41 there are also some women looking on from a distance here's a collection a collection of faithful women servants of the lord jesus christ watching on it says from a distance there's three women Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and Joseph, and Salome. We know from John chapter 25 that they had earlier been right at the foot of the cross. That's what John, 25, John 19, 25 tells us. And most likely, due to all the chaos that was going on there, when things got from, were going from bad to worse, they pulled back in shock, in despair, and stood there now from a distance, observing. Mary Magdalene, who was she? Well, she was a woman that Jesus said earlier on in his public ministry, in his Galilean ministry, he cast out multiple demons out of her. And since then, she had followed Jesus. Mary, the mother of James, it's got those words there, the less, meaning either younger in age or smaller in stature, we don't know. It was a different Mary to Jesus' mother. And Salome was the wife of Zebedee, who, according to John 19, verse 25, was sister to Jesus' mother. Verse 41 there says, When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. They followed him. Meaning, these were women who were devoted to Jesus. They were born again. To follow Jesus is to come to Jesus. And to come to Jesus is to be born again. They were Christian. Why would Mark, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, make mention of this? Why specifically? Well, I think for two reasons. Number one, to remind his initial readers and to remind every person since then, including every single one of us, that women are precious to God. Women are co-equal with men by sharing all the blessings and love and union that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And number two, Mark puts this in here to contrast their faithfulness, as I read this week, with the, with the 11 disciples' fearfulness. Because who's not there? The men. They're not there. John's there. That's it. No men. No disciples. Faithful women are there. The church is full of faithful women. Our church is full of faithful women. 
You are precious in the sight of God. You are co-equal with men and sharing all the blessings and love and union that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here is a contrast between faithfulness and fearfulness. The men bailed and the women stayed. Yes, they stood at a distance. But being in a being just a small distance away in proximity in view of all the horrors that had just unfolded, due to their own timidity, they stand at a distance, is far more faithful than being totally removed from the situation like the men were. These group of women here are courageous. They are precious in the sight of God. And from here, from here on, through to the remainder of the gospel, we will hear much about these women. They're the first to view Christ in the resurrection we'll hear more about them but with all that here now the crucifixion is done it's finished the son of god the death of jesus we just saw the collection of servants in these women we began by looking at the completion of suffering as jesus breathed his last, but understand this, while it may have been the completion of suffering, it is not the completion of the Savior. For he, in just a few days, as he said he would, will rise again victorious. And today he is risen. So we've seen that. In the middle, we saw the work of conversion upon a soldier when he looked to Christ and was saved, he was saved by believing that he is the Son of God. That means that he is co-equal in divinity. That's what that means. He is who he says he is. The soldier believed that and was saved. But what should we take home from all that we've just journeyed through? Well, I think, number one, we need to understand afresh that this atonement was necessary. It was necessary. What do I mean by that? Well, we must not dare, I must not dare, and you must not dare give mere intellectual assent to the crucifixion. Oh, yeah, tip the hat. No, no, no. This atonement was necessary. Dare not we give intellectual assent to what occurred this day under this darkness that fell upon Golgotha. Sin is wickedness. Every sin is deserving of eternal, infinite punishment. Every lie, every lustful look, every outburst of anger, every disobedience to God is worthy and deserving of infinite, eternal punishment. Because it was committed against an internal, infinite God. And for every single Christian sitting here this morning, and I realize that not everyone sitting here this morning is a Christian. You may profess that you are, but you do not possess that you are. Because you have not yet given your life to the Lord Jesus. But for every Christian sitting here this morning, allow this very thing to strike you. And it's this. Your sin, my sin, Merited, that is earned, his punishment upon the cross. As the song goes, it was my sin that held him there. Sin against a holy, infinite God merits an infinite, holy punishment. 
And that punishment, the believer could not bear. Without perishing eternally. And if the believer is to be rescued from that infinite punishment, then an infinite substitute must bear the penalty in the believer's place. No one is capable and no one is worthy to do that. So God becomes a man and pays that infinite price. God dies on the cross for man. The God-man, Jesus Christ. The hymn says, and we sing it loud here, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Did you hear that? For me. For me. Jesus died for me. How can the hymn writer say with such personal implication and in such a personal way, died for me? How can Paul... The Apostle Paul, who said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who what? Who gave Himself for me. Who loved me and gave Himself for me. The reason we can say, like the Apostle Paul and like the hymn writer, that Jesus died for me is because what took place on this day, on this cross, was the accomplishment of the plan of redemption. Made between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Etch this on the doorposts of your heart for the rest of your life. Young person, listen to me. Middle-aged person, listen to me. Dear older saint, listen to me. Etch this on the doorpost of your heart. There was an inter-Trinitarian pact that was made before the foundation of the world. In eternity past. Where the Father designed the plan of redemption. Where the Son agreed to undergo the sacrifice of redemption. And where the Holy Spirit agree, agreed to apply the results of redemption. Redemption planned in eternity past. Redemption accomplished here upon the cross. And redemption applied at regeneration where God by His grace saves a person. And because of that, because of that, that inter-Trinitarian pact between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternity past. Because of that, the nature of the atonement that we've just spent two Sundays in, the nature of that means that it is not a potential atonement. It is not potential. It, that is, it's not contingent upon whether or not you believe in Him or not as to whether He died for you or not. Because if you read the Gospel of John time and time again, Jesus says, all that the Father has given me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. Read John chapter 17. He speaks about a people. That the Father has given him. And for those whom the Father has given him, he loses none of them and he lays his da life down for them. It's a definite atonement. And because it is definite, he took your name and your sin to the cross and you can cry out to the glory of God, he died for me. That's some vague thing. He died for me. Earth-shattering grace. 
And you can cry out, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What grace we stand forgiven at the cross. Redemption accomplished. Redemption applied. The Lord Jesus Christ who is the only. He who is not only the Lamb of God. But the priest who presents the Lamb. Slain. For sinners like me. And for sinners like you. Let's pray. Father we come before you. And say thank you for the immense privilege it is. Lord to be. To be one of the sheep for whom the good shepherd died. Father, help us to never think lightly upon the cross and the grace that is ours. Help us to carry our cross, denying ourselves and finding ultimate satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ. For anyone here who has not yet bowed in humility before the Lord may they know that when they do that they find full lasting forgiveness because full atonement has been made help us now to worship you with our lives for the remainder of this day all through the week and the rest of our lives we pray in Jesus name Amen mm -hmm.